Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin. I have, again, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again. Good afternoon, Brock. What do we got today? We have with us two people who work on the ROX cluster distribution. At least that's what I think it is. I've actually, I'll admit, I'm familiar with it, but I've never used it myself, so I'm flying blind again. Um, they are... Greg Bruno and Mason Katz, and they're both at UCSD. So, guys, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm Mason Katz. I am work at UCSD. I've been here for about 10 years working on the ROX cluster distribution project. Um, prior to that, I worked at University of Arizona doing network security, writing network uh, operating systems. It was a lot of fun. And prior to that, I was a 8-bit embedded developer. So I'm a big fan of the the of the accumulator. <laughs> the uh, good old Z80. Um, Z80. My name is my name is Greg Bruno. I have a very similar background uh, to Mason here for the last ten years. Uh, I hired on one month before he, so I always remind him about how I outrank him in seniority. And but prior to that, I was working at NCR where uh, they build and can still continue to build the world's largest databases. They're using Teradata technology. Okay, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for taking some time. Uh, can you give us a quick rundown on what ROX is meant to accomplish and therefore explain what it is? When you say a cluster distribution, expand on that. So that's that's a good question because we've had this um, question internally for, for many years. We originally, our first release in November 2000, uh, we called ourselves the ROX clustering toolkit and that was that was a name that we put together the toolkit part was added by greg greg and my own boss uh, phil papadopoulos uh name should be last name should be familiar um and at the time we we're a toolkit because we we're really a, a layer of tools that went on top of an existing machine and then allowed you to deploy a cluster and over the years we've become more and more automated more and more turnkey and now we're really more of a distribution we're more of a cluster on a DVD. So you can pop it into one node, turn it into a master for your system, and just one by one bring up your compute nodes with zero human interaction. But we'll get we'll get into the details of that more. Okay. So what's the history? Where did rocks come from? How did it get started? Um, actually, Mason and I met Phil Papadopoulos prior to working on rocks in another lab that was here at UCSD. So all three of us were hired in to, uh, to work for a PI there where he was investigating Windows clusters. So this was in 98? 99. Yeah, 98, 99, when he was investigating Windows clusters. And so we all came on board, and we were all Unix heads, so this was we were really out of our element. And so we were trying to use a lot of the windowing tools in order to, you know, basically put a Windows distribution down onto all the compute nodes reliably. They had all these these programs that did like multicast, and none of them worked reliably. And Phil one day said, "You know what? I'm just going to make a partition on every node, and it's going to run Linux." And at that time, it was Mandrake. And so, anytime we wanted to reimage the entire cluster. Uh, Phil ran a, a program out there that told the nodes go boot back into this one um, Linux partition, and then basically just do a DD in order to you know splat all the new bits down. So that was really kind of the prototype of if you want to reliably build a, you know back end cluster nodes at any sort of scale, Linux is your horse. So what exactly is is Rox? Is it is it middleware? Is it an operating system? Is it a distribution? Uh, you know how how exactly would you classify it? It's it's all of those. Um, Rox includes all of the software you need to go from bare metal to fully functional uh, application ready computational appliance. So Rocks, for example, includes all the bits from you know, all the relevant bits from CentOS. It includes middleware for cluster monitoring, such as Ganglia. Uh, it includes middleware for grids, such as Globus, or did at one time. So it's 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 everything. We actually have referred to it many times as kind of the the hyperdermic. Is this is the hyperdermic you use to inject uh, software onto your bare metal? So it's it's just. 
it, it's the methodology and it's the technology to wrap all that up. OS to application, treating everything the same. Applications are treated no differently from the OS. It's just how do you bundle everything and get it deployed? So te- technology-wise, it's really a distribution, but it includes components from operating system all the way to application, including the middleware. That's a fuzzy answer. So- so, running, give us a, give us a sample scenario, right? So, you you mention a, a really high level one before you you pop in a DVD on a head node and you bring up uh, compute nodes. Give give us a little more detail on on what you know a common scenario is that you see your users doing. Well, let's, let's go to the simple answer of just a just a HPC cluster, an MPI machine. Uh, we'll have people that they buy a few nodes from a tier one vendor. They they have their front end node. They talk to their network admin, get an IP address, simple stuff like that. They go to our web, our website at www.rocksclusters.org. They pop in the DVD, turn on the machine. They answer a few questions. It's just like installing Red Hat. It's actually a little easier because we remove a lot of the installation screens. And they just put in their IP information, time zone, password. Hour later, the front end comes up. They run a very simple command on the front end when they first log in called insert ethers. And they turn on these slave nodes that are all on a private, uh, non-internet routed network. And they just automatically come up. And it takes about 10 minutes a node. You do them a few seconds apart from each other. So really in a matter of two hours, you can go from a room full of 32, 64 nodes and boxes to a fully functioning MPI machine. And that's, that's always been our target. That's where we started. We started funded as NSF-funded and PACI program to build to make it easy for researchers to build their own, build and manage their own MPI machines. And we moved past that, but that's where we started, and that's really what we're best at still. Okay, and so when you say it's about 10 minutes per machine, I assume this means a disk full load. So you're, you're blasting an OS and, and some level of middleware and op, um, um, software and, and other things like that. And uh, that must include, you know, loading it onto the machine itself or, or what? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we do all, all of our installations are from bare metal. And so um, there's, a, there's a lot of benefits there. One of them is, is that when you start from bare metal or you, you, you're actually starting from the empty set. And so when you start from the empty set, that's, that's known, right? You know what the machine was going to do in the, when the, you know, the amount of software in the set is empty. And then as you start to build up, you're going from known state to known state to known state to known state. And so at the, at the end, the configuration and the characteristic of that machine is fully known because you started from a known state and you transitioned all the way through known states. Um, another benefit of having the disk out there on the node is, I mean, simply just uh, to cache the operating system and also to cache applications. So if you're running at scale, having that disk drive there in order to help the nodes, you know, relieve the pressure of the network just to go out and grab some files or some common files or some read-only files is we found that to be a huge benefit. So in the religious debate of diskless versus disk full, it sounds like you guys are coming down on the side of, of disk full. Well, I don't, I don't think it's a religious debate. It's... it's it's, it's what do people prefer. We've chosen as a group just not to worry about the diskless problem. We, we understand that people care about it, and we've, had, we've collaborated with uh, one group, uh, Kessel University, uh, good friends of ours in uh, Bangkok, who created a, a diskless role. So they did add diskless support to rocks. Uh, the project there that they were with is no longer funded, so that's, that's, a support, that's some support that went away. But for us, it's not a religious argument. We're very open to diskless. It's just not something that we've focused on. Okay, fair enough. You mentioned the word role in there. What, what exactly is a role? So a role, a role is a meta package, really. It's, it's the easiest way to think about it. It's, it's a meta package, but it's not just configuration and bits for one machine. It's a meta package for your entire infrastructure for your cluster for your data center even because in that role you have individual packages and in the in the context of linux they're rpms there's a little bit of xml in there that's actually maps directly to uh whatever the automatic installer language is of the os is and in the case of linux that's kickstart so it's a little bit kickstart snippets and it's packages and then that 
those that XML and that Kickstart language actually decides what type of appliance gets what packages. So compute nodes get MPI, visualization nodes get OpenGL, um, database nodes get Postgres. So it's how do you how do you suck up all that information and put in this little tiny self self composed self con, self contained ISO image. Just so, just to follow up. A, I'm sorry, just to follow up a little bit there with Mason. Um, he mentioned um, part of a role is there are uh, a, a collection of XML files. Now, most of these XML files, if you, if you looked at them, it's, it, it basically has one nugget of functionality. And an example we always like to use is SSH. So we have an SSH.XML file inside the, inside the base role. And in there you'll see the configuration of SSH on you know, on every node, because that, that's a common uh, function that we have on every single node. And then there's another file that is, it's, it's a graph specification. And so all of rocks is, the configuration of the node is specified um, as a graph. And we have several, or I should say the root nodes of the graph are what we call appliances. So one root node would be your front end. Another root node would be compute. Another root node would be viz tile. And when a node asks for a kickstart file, we send it over to a CGI, and that CGI looks at that node and says, oh, this is noted IP, address, whatever. We look up in the database to see what, um, what appliance it wants to be. We go to that root node of that appliance, and then we do a graph traversal, of, and this graph traversal is accumulating all of the XML files across that graph. And so getting back to what is a role... A role is this thing that when you add it to the front end, it actually splices itself into a machine. So if you start off as an MPI machine and you bring the viz role on earlier and you also want to create viz tiles from that same rocks machine, what happens is that that graph XML goes and it splices itself into the current base role. Okay, so everything lives in a role, the OS, management tools, the rocks meta tools themselves, everything is belongs to a role. That's right. Everything everything's a role. Okay. So everything's a role. So roles are made up of these XML files and RPMs or tar files? I mean, do they have to be a certain type of package format? Yeah, so again... even expand on that. Um, do you, so do you focus on Linux uh, or do you do other operating systems as well? So like, would RPMs be the Linux way and, and have different kinds of packages for, for other operating systems? Yes, we, we focus primarily on Linux, but we've added support for Solaris. Uh, we added support for Solaris, one, because we were funded by it. Uh, we ended up hiring uh, a new developer to our team a few years ago. His name is Anup Rajendra, uh, who's done an excellent job at taking Rocks, which started out as a very, uh, not just Linux, but very Red Hat-dependent, Anaconda-dependent system, and mapping Kickstart ideas into Jumpstart, which actually isn't that bad because most of the ideas in Kickstart came from Jumpstart. So in many ways, everything that Rocks was doing was being mapped back to where the ideas actually came from, from the underlying OS. Um, so we, to, to, try to, to focus on the OS, OS part of the questions, yeah, right now we do Linux and Solaris. Uh, we view Red Hat as kind of the dominant uh, definition of Linux. That's not to um, diminish the significance of other distributions, just to kind of uh, focus on the reality of we, us being a very small group, being being government funded, and we can't really justify spending our time to to port rocks to yet another Linux distribution when it doesn't really functionally do very much for the users. That's not not to say it's not a great idea, but it's not something we'll do. In Linux, yes, everything maps to a package, an RPM. In Solaris, everything maps to a PKG, just a package. Uh, everything ma maps to jumpstart, jumpstart file in Solaris. Everything maps to a kickstart file in Linux. Roles themselves are packages from whatever the native OS is. And then the XML is really our own invention, but it really looks a lot like kickstart language. And then that can be interpreted, can be parsed 
and convert it into either kickstart language or jumpstart language. So we don't do we don't do tarballs because we really want to take advantage of the native packaging system and being able to do package dependencies. So we do we have very easy easy tools. I mean one command we could say rocks create package and it will take a standard GNU configure make install package and it will build an RPM or even a Mac OS package or a Solaris package for you. So the, the fact that we're focused on RPMs and PKGs isn't really a constraint. It's just the technology we use. We use RPM more of as more of a uh, software distribution methodology. We don't f- use a lot of post sections and packages or anything. We're just using it to wrap up the bits. It's a, it's a, it's a bit transport as far as we're concerned. So one thing you threw in there, you said Mac OS package after you said you supported only Linux and Solaris. So uh, what gives? Is that, a, is that a hint of things to come? or uh, It could be. Uh, to, we were, again, we did Solaris specifically. Well, one, we were interested in it because Solaris brought to the table a kernel with true threads. So from a technology, there's some real, real interest that we have from, from HPC and even non-HPC context. Uh, Mac OS we did. Well, I mean, we're we're sitting here on MacBooks, so it's kind of nice to every now and then build little bits of rocks on the Mac. So there is there we ha- yeah we have the support to build anything in rocks can be built into a Mac OS package. And just to uh, follow up on that on the Mac story, um, there was a um, a guy pretty high up in Apple who was here at um, UCSD, and he was making the rounds and talking to a bunch of different groups, and he said, "Hey, how about rocks on uh, Mac OS X?" We said, sounds great. And he says, okay. Um, and we said, uh, all, all it's going to need is to uh, fund a developer for two to three years. And we haven't heard back from him. <laughs> um, so in, in what you described, I'm going to jump back a little bit in the conversation. What you described for roles, it sounded like there was at least some level of overlap for package dependency resolution, because that's always a sticky problem. And it's and it's such a sticky problem that people have invented multiple systems to to do such things like Yum and Yast and, and and various others. How how do roles compare to that? Is it a, is it a different thing, or do you use those underneath, or or what what do you do? Yeah, we use those tools underneath uh, when we write RPMs. Most of the most of the things that we author for Rocks actually don't have these very strong dependencies, but Rocks is. I don't know, probably 99% third-party software that we're integrating and configuring for people. So for those things that we have to compile, sometimes we specify the dependencies, sometimes we don't. But usually we rely on, in Linux now, in Anaconda now, it's all YUM. So YUM is doing the dependency resolution. But that's just the resolution on what the bits are. That's only half of the story. The other half of the story is what is the configuration, and that's where Rocks comes into play. It's very easy to say... I need X, Y, and Z on all the nodes in my cluster. That's really easy to do. Yum is fantastic at that. Where Yum falls down, and it was never designed to do this, is I need package X, Y, Z on my cluster, and this is my IP address, and I need this service on from, from at, at, on this machine. I need that service off on that machine. It's the configuration that Rocks focuses on. So that XML, those Kickstart files, is really all of the post configuration that you, everything you would have to do after you run yum to get things working and it does things like look up variables in the cluster database to figure out what's going on in the cluster and what things should be doing and just pre-configures everything for you and the dependencies that we care about in the xml and the pre-configuration you have to append to some files before you append to others you have to start some services before you start others so that's where we do our own dependency tracking we don't really we don't address the package dependency problem itself because the underlying technologies do that for us. And we're big, big proponents of not reinventing the wheel. And if I, if I could come into work and not have to write code, that's a really good day. So when you say um, not reinventing the wheel, for the standard cluster tools people, an end user is used to working with MPI libraries, batch systems, Um, compilers, you're not making your own, you're just kind of packaging up things like Torque, SGE, GNU, PGI, just kind of hand over work other people have done in a role form. That's correct. And open MPI, of course, right? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) that one specifically, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, I had had to, it was just uh, mandatory, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So all those things are roles. We are completely agnostic on things like that. 
we roles themselves actually came about because of a conflict. No, not a conflict, but uh, differences of opinions. Some, sometimes a conflict in terms of what uh, local workload manager do people want to use? We we started out in Rock supporting. Was it called PBS then, or Open PBS, or whatever name that they had? I don't know. It was pre pre Torque, obviously. I guess they were just PBS. So we started off on PBS, and SunGrid Engine was started to come out, and we ourselves became big fans of it because we found it easier to run. And we started to have a distribution in Rocks where we would give people the bits, and they would have PBS and SunGrid Engine, and then they'd have to run some crazy command to shut one off. It was completely ridiculous. And we finally figured out how to turn rocks into a component model. And that's, that's really what roles are. Roles are the components in the component model of rocks. And then we made PBS a, a role. We made SGE a role. Uh, we're now, now Torque is a role. Um, there's commercial roles that do PGI and Moab and stuff like that. So it's, it's yeah, pick your favorite middleware. And somewhere there probably is a role for it. Do uh, only you guys create roles, or do other people create roles? So we create, um, you know, kind of the base system and some of these these ancillary uh, middleware things that uh, Mason was just talking about. But then we also have um, a guy, longtime developer, who's been with us up. Uh, he's actually north of the Arctic Circle in Norway, and I've been there in June when the sun never went down, and it completely freaked me out. But that's a side story. And um, so Roy Trump, Roy Trump, so Roy drags it up in Trump. So produces the PBS role because as Mason was talking about, there was a time where we had PBS and SGE and uh, we decided to drop PBS for SGE. And Roy said, hey, I really like PBS. So um, he, he's been the maintainer of that role for several years now. Um, there's some other projects here at UCSD, which uh, they make their own roles. So after we, we come out with our distribution, they bundle up their own tools and put it on. There's, you know, some of those guys are doing um, uh, quantum mechanics codes and other guys are doing visualization codes with that. And then there's also commercial roles out there. So Miracom, um, again, we initially did the Miranet role and uh, we conned them into taking it back, and they've they've done a great job with it. They've they've been pumping that roll out for you know the last couple of years as well. And there's other commercial entities out there that are also um, making rolls. Uh, Cluster Corp is um, another one that that I know of that are making rolls out there. And there's going to be several other institutions and other commercial companies that we have no idea that they're actually making them and using them day to day. So actually you touched on uh, a couple of things there too. So this is obviously a, a wide reaching project, which is a really, really good thing. So you've got some open source guys, you've got some industry players and so on. How, how do you function as, as a project? Do you have core developers, you know, only there in your group, or do you have people who submit patches to you? I mean, do you consider yourself a true open source project with developers and random places around the world or or does it mostly focus on external people making roles or or how does that go so you, so you touched on a lot of a lot of things there and actually this is one of my favorite things to kind of talk about about rocks um, so rocks itself is 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 open source I mean it, it's it meets the basic definition we, we release all of our source code you could watch our development day to day. We don't necessarily, we usually say we're open source, but we're not strictly open development. And what, what we mean by that is if you go around and look at kind of the key open source projects that have truly made an impact, and in some cases even changed the world, they aren't actually open development. There's a very small group of core developers that run the project. And as, as it scales out, you have a very small group of lieutenants that are in charge of accepting patches from the community and usually rewriting them uh, or deciding what to do. So it's 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 a it's a tough line to, to to walk. It's how do you how do you go through and we have a vision of where Rock should be, and we want everybody to be very welcome to the development community. So how do you stay on that vision while at the same time pulling in developers from the outside to help you march towards that? And it's something that we struggle with every day, and it's something that we we really want to do much much better at. But we are in terms of the core of Rocks. Uh, we know exactly where we're going, and we're quite opinionated about it. 
one of the reasons that we created roles to decompose all these things was to open up our development community and the 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 success that we had of um, having Roy Draxith volunteer or be drafted uh, to be kind of our first external ro- role developer was huge. That was a huge one. And since then, I think we've we've come to a point where kind of roles are now 50-50 UCSD, external, commercial, and industry. I mean, commercial and non-commercial. So we're... To to kind of go back, we are open source. Uh, We publish everything we do on Mercurial. We're looking at other tools for this to kind of use better tools. We're all CVS guys internally. Uh, So we're trying to move, trying to change for the times and move to better systems to get get people uh, to be able to contribute better. We do accept patches. Uh, We have contributed patches. We have put patches back into our code. We probably have a 50% hit rate when people submit patches on whether or not they're the right thing to do. We've had... We've had good success and bad success. We had a group in Singapore who were the first guys. These were actually the guys that introduced us to SunGrid Engine. Uh, one of the guys' name was uh, Najin Nimnaba. And he, he did, this is pre-rolls, he put SG into rocks and converted us to it. And those guys were, were just an absolute blast to work with for a very long time. So, and then we've had, we've had guys that have tried to convert patches that would they were great because the patches worked for them, but they didn't work for our community as a whole. It's very easy to write a solution that works for your cluster. It's really hard to write a solution that works for every cluster out there, including clusters you've never imagined. And that's that's what we're trying to do. So it, that actually sounds uh, very similar to a lot of the things that we wrestle with in the OpenMPI project as well, uh, You know, getting patches that are are good for somebody and not for everybody and so on and towing the line of getting new people in but you know staying on vision I, it was I, you you've put to to words very well what I have not been able to express uh well so thanks I, I hope you don't mind I'm probably going to end up borrowing those words from you <laughs> yeah well it's, it's it's really hard open source is difficult a lot of people there was so much hype between uh, um, around kind of cathedral and bazaar release early release often and I'm mean, frankly all this is nonsense it's is, is great for a application. We don't ship an application. And OpenMPI is not an application. It's middleware. It's something critical to the system. If you're shipping one little web service, yeah, release early, release often. We're shipping a system. We can't do that. We, ha- we have to have a formal release process where we start a beta. We go in for a month of beta. We, d- we do code freeze before that for a month. And we're, we're if we're lucky, a two-release-a-year group. But yeah, we're we're, su- we're struggling. We're str- we're struggling with the question, and we we want we're struggling with technology too. To figure out what technologies do you do you use to attract more developers? Because we our intention is not to be closed development. It's just the way things are turning out. We're trying to expand. Yeah, we wrestle with the same thing. I mean, Open MPI. I assume very much like your code base. It's it's complex, and there are subtle reasons why things are the way they are, and it's just something you have to work in the code base for a year or three before you can uh, get the scope of, of what is happening. And I, I assume that this is similar is very true for you. And so even though you have very well-intentioned people submitting patches, you're like, hey, this is great. I, I appreciate the spirit. Thank you. But, you know, that, that kind of thing. And how to not turn away people and get them frustrated because of those things. Now, I, I, I do actually want to touch on one thing that you said in there um, that was very interesting to me. You said that uh, you're using Mercurial, but internally you're all... CVS. I wonder if you could explain that and your rationale for that a little bit. Let me let me just start by um, by saying uh, our boss Phil Papadopoulos has a great line, and he says, "I've been using CVS for twenty years, and CVS has never lost a file for me." And so that one really resonates with me because I mean I've, I've been a long, long, long time CVS user, and again, since we're so small, that we don't run into the big difficulties of, you know, the branching and then trying to, to deal with the, um, the conflict, conflict resolution or conflict resolution in the code, not with the people. And so if, I mean, all you have to do is walk across to the next guy's office and say, Hey, you know, what are you working on to, to try and manage those types of things? I mean, if we were split geographically, CVS may pose a lot more problems than it does today. But in, in, ter- in terms of technology, uh, we've – well, I'll back up. There was – many years ago, 
uh, when I worked in industry, there were, I had I worked with a, with an absolutely fantastic source control system uh, by Sun Microsystems. Uh, it was part of what they called SparkWorks, I think. It was right about the time they were switching from BSD to System 5. And this was a distributed source control system built on top of SCCS, so obviously commercial. But it had this, we, had, we had some consultants across the country, and we had the ability to take a repository, pull off an entire clone that was still hooked up for diffs, and they could operate on that remote repository, commit back there, and then once a month, they'd come over to, um, this is when I lived in Tucson, Arizona. They'd come over to Tucson, and we'd all sit down in a room and move their, their diffs back into the tree. And it was all, the software took care of all this. So I've, I've been a huge fan of distributed source control for 20 years. And I don't know what Sun did, because this software was fantastic, and it disappeared from the face of the earth. And Mercurial, Git... Uh, bizarre. These guys are just now starting to come back to well tools we had 20 years ago. So we lo- we looked at all of them. Uh, we looked at Bizarre for a while. Uh, I really liked it. I love that it was ma- m- only, m- mainly Python because that's what we do most of our stuff in. And it turned out to be just it was just slow. It was just unusable. Uh, Git very very interested when we first looked. Uh, it was just too hard. It's matured a lot. Uh, we're looking at it again now. Uh, starting to do a, a Git role for building Git appliances. So kind of a hint that we may be moving towards that. Uh, and we looked at looked at Mercurial. And Mercurial, it looks pretty good. It's, it's well documented. It's easy to use. Uh, but what we're doing right now is we're committing everything to CVS internally. And once every 20 minutes, I believe, we're doing a CVS checkout into a Mercurial uh, repository, sandbox, clone, I'm not sure what the terminology is. And then that's doing an HG add Dell, I believe the command is, to kind of update that Mercurial, Mercurial repository. And then people can check out from there. So there's a 20-minute latency from, from our HG repository, from, uh, from our CBS repository. And we're using that now for our remote developers. Roy Dragseth used to have CBS access, and we kind of pushed him to Mercurial. Uh, again, we, we drafted him the first time, so we figured we'd draft him as our first guinea pig on uh, distributed source control, and it's, it's worked pretty well. And a new person is a huge fan of it, so he's been doing a lot of his Solaris work in uh, Mercurial. So hopefully the, hopefully the young ends can teach us um, how to do development the right way. Okay, moving on from that. What is some of the um, upcoming features you'd like to add to Rocks that aren't there now, or maybe are in you know your beta branch, or what, what would you like to see Rocks do? Oh wow, that's uh, that's tough. Um, I mean, where where we're focused right now is in the virtualization space. So for the past two years, we've been developing tools to, or to to take the tools that people have come to to know and understand and rocks on building physical machines physical clusters to have that same tool set support virtual clusters and to have that tool chain be almost indistinguishable between the two i mean obviously there's a little bit of dis, you know differences and being able to specify what a vm is but after that we want we wanted all of our Kickstart stuff to work exactly the same, and we also wanted, you know, how we deal with distributions, how we deal with roles, and so um, we're we're actually funded by the NSF to do that. That's what our proposal was focused on was virtualization. So our first release of that was just being able to handle virtual compute nodes. And then the following release we had virtual clusters, so you could deploy a virtual front end which installed your virtual clusters or your virtual compute nodes, and you could have multiple of those things all overlaid on the same physical machine. And also the kind of the last part of our proposal, and we've done some prototyping with, is how do we bring up compute nodes in EC2 and make that part of your cluster? And um, Phil Papadopoulos is the guy who's leading the charge on that one. And so we see that as as a very exciting opportunity where people would have their physical cluster in their lab and either using the physical cluster or they overlay a virtual cluster on top of their own physical cluster 
And when they, for those times when they need a little bit extra CPU power, that, and if they have an account on EC2 and if they have a credit card associated with it, that we have the tool chain that allows them to easily spin up some compute cycles out there when they need it for those peak periods. So that's, that's, I mean, that's the, that's the big area that, that we're looking at these days. So how much of that work is available right now? Um, the EC2 stuff is kind of proof of concept. That's stuff that uh, some of that's, you know, so I, I'm going to quote a line from, from Phil. I'm going to quote a line from our boss. Uh, it's, if it's not in CBS, it doesn't exist. Uh, a lot okay. of that stuff is not in our source control. So it doesn't, you know, it probably is somewhere. Yeah, it doesn't really exist, though. Uh, we, yeah, we're, the EC2 stuff is, is far out there. We're probably, uh, every release we try and say, we get, every developer gets one feature to add to the release. Um, I already know one feature that's going into the next release. Uh, I don't think the EC2 one's going to make it. So I think we're talking two releases out, which means we're a year away. Year away. Well, it's not too bad. I think a lot of people have been, you know, working on that problem, and I haven't seen many solutions that I've liked yet. So uh, be interesting to see uh, a couple other approaches people use. Uh, from there, what is the strangest use of rocks? I've noticed some of the roles you've mentioned have been kind of not what I would normally consider a traditional HPC kind of cluster node or head or anything like that. What's what's one of the oddest roles or uses you've seen? Well, just to kind of tack on to that, I'm, I'm glad that when you went to our site and looked at the roles, some of the roles surprised you. Because I think probably the conception, and it's probably the majority of the clusters which are spun up with rocks, they are HPC clusters. But we're actually more than that, where we can support visualization display walls. We know people who are using rocks to just manage the desktops in their lab. Um, and so it's, it, really, it really is more than HPC. And we, we're, I mean, we, we do what we can to make it more than HPC. But to back up to your question of what are some of the strangest uses of rocks, where one message that came through on our discussion list was um, this guy said, hey, I downloaded your code. I installed a four-node cluster in my garage. Now what do I do? And so we looked at this and just said, I mean, it was funny that the guy took some took our code with no real purpose. He just wanted to get the code, and he wanted to learn about clustering, and he just he spun it up in his, in, his, uh, in his garage, and he just sat there and said, okay, now what do I do? And he was, like, he was, tw- he was twiddling his thumbs there. So I, we, that, was, that was kind of a, a strange, comical use of it. But kind of a really cool use of it is um, a guy who I talked to, and it I escapes me where he's from, but what he's using the cluster for is to do sound processing in a room. And the processing that they're doing is they want to recreate the sound of these great um, uh, halls where, you know, these, these, these fabulous, you know, live performances have been done. So say, you know, hey, I want to be at Arena XYZ, that they, they, they take all the sound and we, they pump it through the cluster and then it comes back out and it replicates what the sound would be like at that venue. And I just I just thought that was just a, a really neat, uh, unique use of uh, clustering technology. Hmm. Well, and my current favorite today is we have a probably a forty tile vis wall being built in Saudi Arabia right now. Not strange, but kind of interesting. And that's actually cool. going on right now. What's the uh, largest rocks install you've seen? Most of the rock systems I'm familiar with are medium sized. What's the largest one out there? Yeah, so um, that's a tough question to answer because the largest cluster um, we're not we're actually not quite sure because we have a volunteer registration page that we ask people from time to time if you're using our software please go to this page and register your cluster there because we use that data to go back to the National Science Foundation to say, you know, basically to beg and say, hey, look, look at, look at these people that are using our software that you're funding us. It's, it appears to be, you know, fairly widespread and it's being used, 
you know, for all, all sorts of different reasons. So please keep giving us money so we can continue to pay our mortgages. So we, um, on that page, I believe there is a cluster in Germany that has about 8,000 CPUs. So you can imagine it's at least, gonna, it's at least 1,000 nodes, maybe 2,000 nodes. Um, we know of a cluster out in uh, the University of Nebraska at Omaha that's 1,200 nodes. So, um, oh, and there's also one, uh, Roy Draxith from the University of Tromsø, who, who we've mentioned a couple times already. He's got a pretty large cluster, I think about a thousand node cluster as well, up in uh, Norway. Cool. So you guys have mentioned a couple of times uh, throughout that uh, you know you're, you're trying to your, your roots are definitely HPC, but you're trying to grow beyond that. And you've given at least one example of you know virtualization, but you've mentioned a, a variety of other appliances as well. Um, so what what are you doing? Uh, you know, to what else do you want Rocks to do? What else are people uh, you know commonly and maybe uncommonly using Rocks for besides HPC? Again, HPC is our core. It's it's where we came from. It's where most of our users came from and still are. Uh, our, our ambitions are for rocks to be a a general purpose uh, data center controller. And that's really what it is. A cluster just happens to be a subset of what's in a data center. But it, it rocks, again, rocks is the hypodermic for putting bits and configuration into your system. So we have the the easy the easy path away from HPC, which several of our users have taken, is how do I take rocks and just run a computer lab? Because it's still a cluster. It still has a private network. And we have users that will set up a nice computer lab for the undergrads. Lab, lab A comes in at 10 a.m. They pound away on the systems for a while. 11.50 hit, 10.50 or 11.50 hits. Students leave. And they re-image all the machines to get rid of all the stuff that students do to machines that you don't want on your network. And then it's ready for the next class. So that, that's kind of a simple example to, to expand beyond HPC. But we're, we're trying to figure out how to generalize more. Uh, we, we handle okay. – this is just one example where we've, we've moved away. If this cluster is an open GL machine as opposed to an open MPI machine, other than that, it's so the same. Um, a database clusters are just clusters of Postgres servers or MySQL servers. We build clusters. A cluster doesn't mean HPC. Okay, so can we get some contact information, mailing list, website, IRC channel? Where are you guys available? Uh, our website is www.rocksclusters.org. And all the information is there. We have, two, we have a mailing list that you can see from our docs. Uh, we have every week we run something called Office Hours. We're one of us, and so far, I think it's been 90% Greg Bruno, maybe 99% Greg Bruno, uh, is on for a week on Skype for to answer your users' questions. Our mailing list is very active. We've got 2,000, 3,000, 2,000. 2,000 users on our mailing list right now. So that's signal, – signal to noise is pretty good. And just uh, one more thing there is uh, yearly in about mid-May, we put on uh, Roxapalooza. And so that's our all hands uh, meeting. We've we've had uh, a couple of them here, uh, one up in AMD at Sunnyvale, one in Singapore, and I think that's all. And we've had four, right? We've had four, yeah. and uh, we haven't planned where the fifth one's going to be. It'd probably be at UCSD. But so every year we have a, a meeting that lasts about a day and a half or uh, two and a half days, and we try and bring um, some developers together and also some uh, new users. We have. Uh, we generally have like a, a, a basic track that kind of gives an overview of clusters and rocks in general. And then we have more of an advanced track where people can um, really understand uh, role, the role structure and how to build their own roles. And that, that, that event is always a free event for uh, academics. And we usually charge commercial users a little bit so we can pay for the food and take care of everybody. 